So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are studying Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Dalloway. So in this particular lecture we we'll look at some of the characteristics of Septimus Smith because remember uh, we discussed how he was one of the first examples in fiction, in English fiction of a PTSD sufferer. You know he's obviously suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and he's a first World War veteran he comes back to the war, uh, to London after the war and finds it almost impossible to emotionally, existentially and biologically and metabolically reintegrate himself with the uh, post-war rhythms of London. So we see in this section that we will uh, study some details and this should be on your screen. Uh, the, the entire experience of Septimus in the war, uh, his history of joining the war, uh, his experience of suffering in the war and his history of love in the war. He fell in love with a man, although never quite sure if there was some homoerotic uh, you know, undercurrents in that relationship. It's never spelled out for us but the indications are there quite clearly and of course the, uh, the guilt that he has as a survivor, the survivor's guilt, the technical term for it and of course how every, all of this informs his trauma and how it's essentially uh, medically misunderstood. Right, so this, this experience of being medically misunderstood obviously adds to his alienation. Okay, so and this is the uh, section on his screen, so which should uh, you know, give us an idea of Septimus's history with the war, his engagement with the war. So Septimus was one of the first to volunteer. He went to France to save the England, which consisted, uh, which consisted almost entirely of Shakespeare's plays and Miss Isabel Poe in a green dress walking in a square. So you know, the England of the genteel people, the England of high culture, that was uh, supposed to be protected and that was the idealism with which he went to the war. It is obviously a degree of sarcasm about it because if you, if you know the history of the wars, we find that most of the soldiers who fought in the war, uh, they obviously came from working class backgrounds. Uh, very few of them came from uh, upper middle class backgrounds and you know the, the entire causality, the people who suffered the most, uh, they came from that kind of background as a result of which we find that the, the demographic disturbance uh, after the war in England was very class based uh, and we saw a little bit of that in, uh, in Eliot's um, you know, The Wasteland where we have this conversation with two working class women uh, talking about the lads, uh, the husbands coming back from the war and want to have a good time. Okay, so this was the England he wanted to protect, he wanted to save the England, the England of Shakespeare's place and Miss Isabel Pohl, again a very genteel, typical genteel woman uh, in a green dress walking in a square. There in the trenches, uh, the change with Mr. Brewer desired when an advice football was produced instantly, he developed manliness. So we find that and I mentioned one of my own essays on this which I am happy to upload. Uh, so Virginia Woolf's uh, De Mrs. Dalloway is a very good example of military masculinity and how that is medicalized after the war. Uh, how the, uh, the entire constructed masculinity is uh, essentially constructed and then how that gets decimated existentially and experientially. Uh, due to the war. So he developed manliness by playing football in the war we are told. He was promoted, he drew the attention, indeed the affection of his officer Ivans by name. So again look at the a very uh, covert description over here. He drew the attention, indeed the affection of the officer uh, Ivans by name. So the affection could be erotic, the affection could be you know, entirely platonic, the affection could be military, you know, collegial, we do not quite know but the word is obviously quite loaded. It was a case of two dogs playing on a hurt hurt rug, one worrying a paper screw, snarling, snapping, giving a pinch now and then at the old dogs here, the other lying somnolent, blinking at the fire, raising a paw, turning and growing, growling good temperedly. They had to be together, share with each other, fight with each other, quarrel with each other. But with Evans, Razia had only seen only seen him once, uh, called him a quiet man, a sturdy red haired man, undemonstrative in a company of women. When Evans was killed just before the armistice in Italy, Septimus, far from showing any emotion or recognizing that there was an end of a friendship, congratulated himself upon feeling very little and, and very reasonably. That is, this is very, very uh, loaded and it takes a degree of unpacking away. Uh. So, Evans is one of those uh, spectral figures in Mrs. Dalloway. He is not a figure anymore in the sense he is not a character, he has been killed, but he is someone who is always there, with some kind of a Hamlet's father like presence. Uh, very ghostly, very spectral but also informing the emotional landscape uh, in this particular novel uh, just like uh, Hamlet's father informs the emotional landscape in that play. Uh, so Ivan uh, Razi had just seen him once and had described him as a quiet man, uh, undemonstrative in the company of women. So you can look at the way, look at the markers of masculinity at play over here. Someone in order to be a manly man, a military manly man, 
you must not uh, demonstrate your emotions, demonstrate too much in the company of women. You must have the stiff upper lip. You must have the stiffness, which is part of the manliness package, right? So obviously, all these markets are very important. So, and then uh, we also told when Evans was killed. Uh, Set him as far from crying, didn't even show an emotion. Uh, indeed, he congratulated himself uh, upon feeling very little and very reasonably. So, this feeling very little and very reasonably is obviously part of the training they had received uh, out of this masculinity building exercise which the war had uh, operated. So, the entire idea of masculinity uh, and the entire idea of manliness is obviously constructed uh, through certain emotional training processes. And part of the process uh, teached, uh, uh, taught this man to feel little. So, feeling was seen to be a uh, feminine. So, a feeling man would be an effeminate man in this kind of a vocabulary, in this kind of a uh, moral mapping. Uh, and obviously, uh, an effeminate man will not be very reasonable. So, again, look at the way in which the lack of feeling and reason are equated with each other, both combined together to, to create this marker of masculinity, right? So, something which is supposed to be very masculine in quality. Now, obviously, uh, what this novel shows quite clearly, what this passage shows specifically, is how this constructed masculinity is essentially engineered uh, through certain training rituals, physical training, you know, moral training, emotional training, in order to create this package of masculinity, which does not feel much, which does not express emotions in front of women, and which uh, holds uh, reason at a very high premium. Okay, so the war had taught him it was sublime. He had gone through the whole show, friendship, European war, death, had won promotion, was still under 30 and was bound to survive. He was right there. The last shells missed him. He watched them explode with indifference. When peace came, he was in Milan, billeted in the house of an innkeeper with a courtyard, flowers and tops, little tables in the open, daughters making hats. And to Lucrezia, the younger daughter, he became engaged one evening when a panic was on him that he could not feel. Now, this becomes obviously this is the reason why I chose this passage because this shows us not just the history of uh, Septimus's military experience, it also shows us quite clearly the history of Septimus's emotional experience. So, and this obviously accounts for his lack of emotions now. Because for a long time, when he joined the army, when he was grafted in the army, when he volunteered in the war, he was taught through different drills, through different training programs that not feeling or not emoting or not feeling an emotion is something of a manly moral trait. As part of the uh, you know moral manliness or the manly morality, whatever way you want to put it, uh, and that's something that he should exercise and exhibit the you know the feelinglessness. And you find that when the war goes away, that becomes a condition, that becomes a neurotic condition, that becomes so internalized in him that even if he wants to, he cannot feel anymore. Now, those of you uh, who have read uh, Catherine Mansfield's The Fly, the short story by Mansfield, would know that this is something which has obviously been satirized and caricatured uh, and decried and deconstructed by uh, Virginia Woolf and also by Mansfield in that story, The Fly, where we have this character of a boss, uh, someone who has again trained himself not to feel uh, through a patriarchal process. And Septimus too had, been, uh, had gone to the institution of military masculinity, which had taught him not to feel, which had shown him the moral values of not feeling, the moral values, the superior moral values of being undemonstrative, of not exhibiting an grief, exhibiting an emotion. And we see how when he was in Milan, when the armistice was signed, when the war came to an end formally, he was in Milan. And he was with this uh, innkeeper uh, who had his daughters so making hats, and he got engaged uh, to Lucretia in a moment of panic. And this panic is important because you know, the panic was he was began to realize that if he wants to, even if he desires to, he cannot feel anymore. Because the entire training of not feeling has so internalized in him, it's so ingrained inside him that he cannot feel anymore, even if he wants to, right? So he got engaged to Lucretia in a moment of panic. Now, of course, what that also means is that we have this entire suffering of Lucretia accentuated because she got engaged to a man uh, who just needed a woman uh, to come out of his shell, uh, to come out of his feeling lessness. So, she was essentially an experiment. Uh, she was essentially a guinea pig, so to say, uh, in his emotional um, experiment uh, that he was uh, beginning to try because he was obviously uh, suffering from a lack of feeling and he wanted to come out of the suffering, he wanted to feel again. So, he got very hurriedly and panically, uh, in a panic stricken way, he got engaged to Lucretia. And that was what uh, the, uh, the entire history of marriage and military experience all about. Okay, uh, and now we have a series of uh, episodes why we are told that Septimus now panics, that Septimus now begins to get more and more, uh, you know, uh, depressed uh, and it gets more and more, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, disturb with the entire experience of not being able to feel, even if it wants to feel. Okay, that's something which we find even in the short story by Mansfield, where the character of the boss, who's not mentioned, obviously he's a every man, the every patriarch, uh, who despite wanting to feel, cannot feel anymore, because for a long time, he had denied himself feeling. He had uh, trained himself not to feel, trained himself not to grieve, uh, because of certain reasons. So if you read the story, you'll find what I'm talking about. It should be available online, Catherine Mansfield's The Fly. Okay, and now we come uh, to the point where Septimus finds himself completely alienated uh, from not just the urban landscape, but also from the emotional landscape around him. Because for a long time, in the military trenches, in the war trenches, he had trained himself not to feel. And now that he's back in the civilian space, he cannot feel anymore because the ability to feel has gone completely, disappeared completely, uh, due to this rigorous training that he has had on himself. For now that it was all over, truce signed and the dead buried, he had, especially in the evening, these sudden thunderclaps of fear. So he's panicking, he's had this th sudden, uh, you know, grab of fear, you know, this, this, you know, he's seized by fear on so many occasions. He could not feel. As he opened the door to the room, uh, of the room where the Italian girls sat making hats, he could see them, could hear them. They were rubbing wires among colored beds and sauces. They were turning uh, buckram shapes in a way, the, you know, this way and that. The table was all strewn with feathers, spangles, silks, ribbons, scissors uh, were wrapping on the table, but something failed him. He could not feel. So again, the, this is a recursive thing, a recursive phenomenon. He could not feel, he could not feel, he could not feel. That's told to us on several occasions to uh, accentuate the emotional hollowness that he's experiencing in the moment that he cannot feel anymore uh, despite trying. Okay, still, scissors wrapping, girls laughing, hats being uh, protected, uh, hats being made protected him. He was assured of safety, he had a refuge, but still he could not sit there all night. There are moments of waking in the early morning. Uh, the bed was falling, he was falling, all for the scissors and the lamplight and the buckram shapes. He asked Lucrezia to marry him, and the younger, the younger of the two, the gay, the frivolous, uh, with those little artist's fingers that she would hold up and say, it's all in them, silk feathers, what were not alive to them. So obviously the tragedy of Lucrezia gets accentuated over here. Yeah. I mean, she gets, uh, she ends up being married to a man uh, who out of panic proposes uh, uh, for marriage because he feels he's running out of feelings. So marriage to Lucrezia is an experiment for Septimus, as I mentioned, and she becomes a sufferer, she becomes a victim of this male experiment post-war. Okay, and that's something which we find uh, quite uh, uh, recursively and she finds obviously uh, herself as an outsider and this should be on a screen. Uh, you know, the English are so silent, Razia said. She liked it, she said. She respected this Englishman, wanted to see London and the English houses and the tailor-made suits and could remember hearing how wonderful the shops were from an aunt who had married and lived in Soho. Uh, it might be possible, Septimus thought, looking at England from the train window as a left New Haven, it might be possible that the world itself is without meaning. Again, so you have this experience of absurdity which is beginning to grip Septimus. And we have this completely contrasting perspectives on London. Uh, Rezia comes to London uh, with a lot of aspirations. She's heard about London. She's consumed uh, stories about London for a long time from her aunt who had been married to someone over there. And, uh, and then she wanted to see these different markers of Englishness, the tailor-made suits, uh, the Englishman, uh, the English horses, the different markers, metonymy markers of Englishness. She had obviously this very, very romantic idea of London. And now Septimus obviously is the averse of romanticism. Uh, he finds himself in a situation where he cannot feel anymore and it begins to feel that the world itself around him might be without any meaning. So in other words, he's began to feel the absurdity of existence over here. So in that sense, Septimus may be um, linked, uh, he might be uh, compared to some one of those classical figures uh, in classical literature who come back from the hell, you know, who's seen hell, come back from the hell and cannot integrate back into the uh, living society anymore. Okay, so. <clears throat> And this whole idea of the English being serious, uh, you know, is something that uh, Lesia, uh, Lucretia keeps saying uh, all the time. And that at first it was to him, uh, to her, uh, an act of uh, a feeling of, uh, you know, uh, admiration that uh, she wanted to see the Englishman as serious, and that was part of the attractive package for her. But together, uh, you know, with time, he, he, she begins to realize that this lack of feeling is something which is actually being uh, masquerading as seriousness. And this obviously becomes more difficult for her. It alienates her. It makes her completely insulated. Uh, from everything around her. Uh, so she becomes this cultural, linguistic and also uh, the entire uh, political outsider, being an Italian woman after the First World War, stationed in London. Okay, and now uh, 
the whole idea of not bringing children to this world becomes important and in the connection to Greek tragedy becomes more and more, uh, you know, organic way, yeah. Uh, one cannot bring children into a world like this. One cannot perpetuate suffering or increase the breed of these lustful animals who have no lasting um, emotions but only whims and vanities, adding them now this way, now that. So this entire idea, this entire experience of exhaustion uh, in Septimus has obviously been also of sexual exhaustion, moral exhaustion, existential exhaustion. Now what that has made him uh, at the moment is he, he's not in a position to even think of bringing children to the world, which obviously is another uh, an act of unfairness on, on Razia, on Lugrasia, right? Because he decides to abstain from sex, he decides to abstain from reproduction, uh, and that obviously is part of the trauma package that he's suffering, that he's experiencing in the moment, but obviously that becomes very, very unfair uh, to Lugrasia, whose opinion is never asked. So she becomes the agency less character, because a lot of time we talk about Se uh, Mrs. Salloway as being this entire experience of Septimus Smith as this alienated, misunderstood survivor of the war. But also what must be equally paid attention to is the fact that she's, he's married to someone uh, whose outsiderness is compounded by her political status. She's an Italian in London after the First World War. So she is technically from the enemy state and now she's married to this Englishman uh, and of course she is completely cut off from everything because Septimus would not, you know, first of all he's not emotionally stable and second Secondly, he does not help her integrate into society because he himself is so disintegrated after the First World War. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so again, the whole experience of uh, being denied motherhood is something that like Lucretia suffers over here. At T, Razia told him that she, Mrs. Filmer's daughter was expecting a baby. She could not grow old and have no children. Uh, she was very lonely. She was very unhappy. She cried for the first time they were married, uh, since they were married. Far away, he heard her sobbing. He heard it accurately. He noticed it distinctly. He compared it to a piston thumping, but he felt nothing. So we find that this becomes almost a medical condition for Septimus, the, the ability not to feel anymore, the ability not to be able to empathize anymore. So it becomes uh, a completely empathyless individual, an empathyless subject. He cannot connect to anyone emotionally. And also notice the way in which the sound of his uh, wife sobbing and pain, sobbing and, and alienation, sobbing and, 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 and complete isolation, it reaches him and uh, through a wave pattern which makes it sound like a piston thumping. So again, the very human vital uh, activity of crying, the very emotional activity of crying has been compared with the machinic metaphor. Now, if you remember, something similar happened in Elliot's Wasteland. When we have this, uh, the scene of very loveless sex between the clerk and the typist, and when the clerk leaves, the typist puts a, uh, an, an automatic hand on a gramophone and starts to absorb the music in a very machine-like way. So the gramophone becomes uh, 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 almost humanized away, uh, and a man, the human being, becomes uh, in a in a mechanized away, and that kind of a, a strange reversal of relationships. And something similar happens here as well. Every sound that comes to Septimus is made it through a machine, right? So you know he compares the crying, the sobbing of Razia with the thumping of a piston. So the piston obviously is a machine, and that sound of the piston thumping has been compared to the sound of his wife crying. And the final line is obviously very, very uh, you know, it, it is indicative of his uh, condition. He felt nothing. So in other words, there's nothingness in him. Uh, so there's no, not, there's no feeling at all. There's absolute nothingness in his inside him, inside the system, and that makes him existentially completely exhausted. So part of his exhaustion is also an emotional exhaustion, an existential exhaustion, right? And that becomes uh, the part the nothingness that he embodies with his uh, suffering self. His wife was crying and he felt nothing. Uh, only each time he sobbed, she sobbed in this profound, silent, this hopeless way, he descended another step into the pit. Right, so obviously he is in a depression, and you know the descent into depression becomes more and more dramatic. is accentuated when he sees the, when his wife suffer. Uh, at the same time, he realizes he's not able to feel anything, and his knowledge of nothingness is important over here. He's aware of his nothingness. He's aware of the fact that he cannot feel anymore, and that knowledge uh, consumes him even more, and it descends, uh, you know, in increasingly into a pit. The pit being a metaphor, obviously, the spatial metaphor of depression over here. Okay, so. Uh, <coughs> Now, we cut into this uh, interesting characterization over here, which is a complete contrast to the characterization uh, embodied by Septimus, and this is uh, Dr. Holmes, uh, the surgeon who is treating him, the, who is examining him, who obviously represents this very masculinist medicine uh, in post-war England. <coughs> 
So Dr. Holmes uh, examined him. There was nothing whatsoever the matter, said Dr. Holmes. So he had decided there's nothing the matter with Septimus. There's no problem with Septimus. Oh, what a relief. What a kind man. What a good man, thought Razia. When he felt like that, he went to the music hall, said Dr. Holmes. He took a day off with his wife and played golf. Why not try two tabloids of bromide dissolved in a glass of water at bedtime? Those old Bloomsbury houses, said Dr. Holmes, tapping the wall, are often full of very fine paneling, which the landlords have the folded to paper over. Only the other day, visiting a patient, so somebody, some something in Bedford Square. So we have Dr. Holmes, obviously a very pompous man, full of himself, uh, full of his male ego. And he says, you know, this is nothing. Septimus has no problem at all whatsoever. There's no physical condition that he's actually suffering from. He's entirely made up. He's probably malingering. Uh, but let him have a day off. When I have a day like this, I go and play golf. I spend time with my wife. I take a day off. So again, you know, this is part of the production narrative in which he is in. So when I begin to feel unproductive or take a day off, do something, which is part of this consumerist narrative and then come back and be productive again. Now Septimus obviously has become permanently unproductive. So here becomes a problem uh, in this production consumption uh, narrative that you know, London is obviously exhibiting as a metropolis, right? So, you know, and he's been advised by Dr. Holmes to take a day off, play golf, play cricket, do different things, etc. In other words, to man up. And obviously, uh, this becomes ironic because we are told that we just saw before the Septimus for a long time. Uh, when he went to the war, he had tried to man up to different rituals, emotional rituals, physical rituals, military rituals, etc. Okay, um, so there was no excuse, nothing whatever the matter, except the sin for which human nature had condemned him to death that he could not feel. So again, the whole idea of feeling lessness keeps coming back as a recursive marker of Septimus' condition. He had not cared when Evans was killed. That was worse. But all the other crimes raised their heads and shook their fingers and jeered and sneered over the rail of the bed in the early hours in the morning at the prostrate body which lay realizing its degradation. How he had married his wife without loving her, had lied to her, seduced her, outraged Miss Isabel Perrault, and was so pocked and marked with vice a woman shuddered when they saw him in the street. The verdict of human nature on such a wretch was death. Right, so his complete isolation and alienation of Septimus is being uh, described away. Uh, and obviously his guilt of having seduced his wife into a loveless marriage is something which we are told again. So again, the recursive marker is feeling lessness. So the war, so the, the, the real problem as you can see by now is not really the trauma of the war, but before, what had happened before, the entire masculinist training of manning up, which had taught him the virtue of not feeling, the virtue of not demonstrating feeling. Now, what was then a virtue has now become a condition, has now become a medical condition, because that is so internalized in him that he cannot, he did not, he could not historically express grief when his friend died. He could not exhibit an emotion when, you know, he was supposed to exhibit emotions. And that emotionlessness has now become, now converted into a permanent state of feelinglessness, which is now beginning to consume him as a person. Dr. Holmes came again, large, fresh-colored, handsome, flicking his boots, looking in the glass. He brushed it all aside. Headaches, sleeplessness, fears, dreams, nerve symptoms, and nothing more, he said. So again, this is uh, very historically true. Uh, so contemporary, you know, Septimus's contemporary medicine or medical politics, they completely uh, failed to engage with or failed to understand the entire idea of uh, war trauma. They gave them, they gave the war trauma different names, shell shock being one of them. Uh, which obviously was very, very inadequate because sometimes uh, even the doctors conceded that a real shell, a real expo explosion of shell had nothing to do with uh, the trauma. So it was a combination, a very interesting uh, combination, a very pathological combination of first manliness and the trauma of the war put together because the first manliness which obviously trained them to be military men had told them not to feel, had showed them, had trained them not to feel. And this training into feeling lessness is now what has eaten them up exactly, right? So Dr. Holmes, who obviously uh, is someone who colludes with that kind of military masculinity, he's, he's, he's part of the medical masculinity. And again, this is quite tyrannical, uh, quite patriarchal, quite bombastic, quite pompous, and quite complacent in his own knowledge. He, he seems to know everything. There's a lot of mansplaining over here which is happening. So he dismissed Septimus's condition at once and says that all these uh, examples, all these symptoms, headaches, sleeplessness, fears, dreams uh, are just mere nerve symptoms. Now, as I mentioned when I began reading uh, Mrs. Dalloway, this was a time, uh, this is historically very, very true, this is exactly uh, the complete failure of the British medicine to engage with the PTSD victims at that point of time. So this was a time 
interestingly, when Freud and Freud and psychoanalysis became very, very important uh, and the whole idea of converting dreams into narratives, uh, dreams into stories which were told to the doctor, which were listened to by the doctor became very, very important. So, you know, that, that, that opened up a different era, a different uh, narrative of healing uh, at that point of time. Well, obviously, people like Holmes and Brush or the doctors who are obviously pre-Freudian and would be anti-Freudian, uh, they failed to engage with the medical problem of PTSD uh, at that time. So, you know, Holmes and Brush are seen as two, uh, you know, masculinous, monstrous medical agents of that time uh, who were failing to understand the real emotional depth of this crisis. Okay. Uh, so, you know, these are brushed aside, uh, septimosis conditions are brushed aside as mere nerve symptoms, so very minor nervous problems. If Dr. Holmes found himself even half a pound below 11 so on 6, uh, he asked his wife for another plate of porridge at breakfast. Uh, Rezia would learn to cook porridge. But so, you know, look at the way in which the physicality of Dr. Holmes is maintained. So, 11 pounds, uh, uh, you know, 11 pounds, 11 stone 6, sorry, 11 stone 6, which is roughly 73 kilograms of weight. That was the weight that Dr. Holmes maintained. So, again, look at the quantifiability of health the way. Uh, every marker of health is quantifiable. Uh, you need to maintain a certain weight. And if you fall below the weight, even by half a pound, we increase the diet. So he, he would advise, he would ask, he would demand from his wife uh, another plate of porridge for breakfast just to keep up uh, the threshold weight, as it were. And hearing that Razia realizes that she would learn to cook porridge. But he continued, health is largely a matter in our own control. Throw yourself into outside interests. Take up some hobby. He opened Shakespeare, Antonio and Cleopatra. Put Shakespeare aside. Some hobby, said Dr. Holmes, for he did not uh, did he not owe his own excellent health and worked as hard as any man in London to the fact that he could always switch off from his patients uh, or on to an old furniture? And what a pretty little, very pretty calm, if he might say so, Mrs. Warren Smith was wearing. So we find that uh, this is a complete package uh, in terms of the flirtatious nature of the doctor and also this very pompous humbug quality that he exhibits so where he seems to know everything and he gives he keeps giving his own example as a model masculine uh, embodiment and he says that you know if I, if I fall below the desired weight even by half a pound I increase my diet just so I maintain that particular threshold uh, and the, I should read Shakespeare he opens Shakespeare he advises people to take up different hobbies excellent uh, hobbies and excellent health is a, is a, is a precondition for any uh, uh, experience of happiness. Uh, so, the whole idea of being this happy male uh, is aligned to the idea of being this productive male. So, productivity and happiness, they are aligned with each other over here. And it is very, very capitalist, uh, post war capitalist framework that is embodied by Dr. Holmes over here. Uh, and while he is talking about you know, his old hobby of collecting old furniture, uh, he remarks on the prettiness of Mrs. Uh, Warren Smith or Lagracious Combe, uh, which is obviously part of the uh, flirtatious narrative that he exhibits over here. Okay. When the damn fool came again, Septimus refused to see him. Did he indeed? Said Dr. Holmes, smiling agreeably. Really, he had, he had to give that charming little lady, Mrs. Smith, a friendly push before he could get past into her husband's bedroom. Right? So, uh, the Septimus' refusal to engage with his doctors is obviously very symbolic. Uh, that's this shutting down against this uh, tyrannical masculinist medicine. But obviously, that tyrannical masculinist medicine makes its way in uh, by pushing aside Mr. Smith. So, obviously, what this shows is the agency lessness. It's very, um, you know, lopsided or imbalanced uh, location of agency in this doctor patient relationship, where the doctor seems to have entire agency, he seems to have entire knowledge, and the patient seems to be just a passive victim, a passive subject, controlled and coerced by the doctor. So, you are in a funk. He said agreeably, sitting down by his patient's side. So, funk being the, you know, a colloquial term for depression. He had actually talked to uh, of killing himself to his wife, quite a girl, a foreigner, wasn't she? So, one of the things that uh, Mrs. Dalloway does very well is very quick shift in focal points. So, in most of these uh, situations, we see the entire episode through Lagrange's eyes, but certainly we also get a little micro focus from the doctor's eyes, uh, where we are described that you know, Septimus's wife is a pretty little girl and also a foreigner. So, this quick shift of focal points becomes uh, very interesting in the narrative uh, technique of Mrs. Dalloway.
Didn't that give her a very old idea of English husbands? So again, he's almost sympathetic towards her in the sense that Septimus's condition must have given her, he thinks, uh, you know, a very bad impression about English husbands. Didn't one owe perhaps a duty to one's wife? Wouldn't it be better to do something instead of lying in the bed? For he had had 40 years experience behind him and Septimus could take Dr. Holmes's word for it. There was nothing whatever the matter with him. So again, look at the failed diagnosis of the situation. Dr. Holmes says repeatedly and with complete conviction that he has 40 years of experience behind him and is completely convinced that Septimus has no problem whatsoever. So again, this very mansplaining situation becomes important. He's this pompous, knowledgeable medical man who knows everything about everything and he's giving Septimus his own description of his own condition. And next time Dr. Holmes came, he hoped to find Smith out of bed and not making that charming little lady his wife anxious about him. So again, if you look at the rhetoric, the vocabulary over there, the metaphors over here are very condescendingly male, right? So the woman is always charming, the woman is always pretty, the woman is always fidgety and you know he feels almost a degree of pity for the woman and he feels pity for the woman because uh, he thinks that Septimus is giving her a very bad impression of English husbands. So he tells Septimus, the next time I come back to see you, you better take care of your wife. And so the, the entire patronizing perspective, the gaze is extremely patronizing and offensive and reifying also because everything is reified, everything is commodified away. The wife is, the wife or the patient is commodified, the patient is commodified, the patient's condition is commodified, everything is very reductively done. So, uh, you know, uh, the entire medical vocabulary away uh, is a reflection of the medical science and the medical treatment, which is very reductionist in quality. If nothing was wrong physically uh, in, the per in the patient's body, nothing can be possibly wrong at all. So, any idea, any engagement with emotional crisis was completely done away with and that was seen as effeminate, right? That wasn't part of the manly behavior, the ideal manly behavior that Septimus is supposed to exhibit uh, as an ideal war veteran. So, we, f we find how this entire collusion but in medical science and masculinity takes place in Mrs. Jalloway. And again, my article on this uh, exactly touches upon these lines. I'm happy to upload it uh, in the portal for you to read. Uh, so you find that its collusion is important because as part of the masculinity package, which had also created the war, because uh, the war was essentially greed of men, for men, for more territories, uh, for the lust for power. Uh, that was, you know, part of this very masculine political thing, right? And now we find even in medicine, which is supposed to heal and you know cure people, that becomes informed by the same masculine uh, rhetoric, the very same masculine metaphors of control, coercion, and treatment, uh, where people are forced to think that they are well. People are forced to be confined to bed. People are forced to do things against the will. So the question of agency becomes a very, very important way up. Yeah. And we see how medicine or medical treatment instead of healing makes things worse for the PTSD sufferer for the uh, trauma sufferer from the war, which is part of the existential complexity in this particular novel. So we stop at this point today and, and hopefully conclude this in the next couple lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.